بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين. We praise Allah subhanahu wa taala. We send blessings and salutations upon Muhammad صلى الله عليه وسلم. His household, his companions. We ask Allah subhanahu wa taala to bless them and to bless every one of us and to grant us goodness. My brothers and sisters, when someone does something wrong, when someone does something wrong, be it a mistake or intentional, how do you react? It's a question that we need to ask and we need to go back to the lives of the companions of the Prophet and Rasulullah and take a look at how Muslims should actually look at it. So if we go back to Rasulullah we will find from the very beginning when Islam was just starting to be spread among the people of Quraysh. We find that the Prophet ﷺ, when they tried to hurt him, when they swore at him, when they threw things at him, when they belied him, when they mocked and jeered at him, when they came out to even try to kill him, his intention was always to try and correct them. That's the best intention. The intention was never to harm them back. It was never to destroy them. It was never to hurt them. It was to correct them. If they stopped doing what they did, that was good enough. If they then had the remorse and regret and they made amends and apologized, it was even better for them. So when someone does wrong to us, the intention of a Muslim should be, how can this man be helped? How can this woman be helped? How can this group of people be helped? How can we assist them? And this is the reason why in Ta'if, when the Prophet ﷺ was given the option of destroying the people between the mountains, instead he complained about his own weakness. He wanted to help them, but he couldn't help them. You see, they didn't want the help actually. It was in the hands of Allah. So he says, Allahumma inni ashku ilayka la'fa quwwati. Oh Allah, I'm complaining to you about my own weakness. What was the weakness? There was no weakness actually. But he felt so much grieved for those people who were doing something they didn't realize. They didn't know. They didn't understand. So he says, Allahumma hdi qawmi fa innahum la ya'damun. Oh Allah, guide my people. They don't know. They don't realize what they're doing. Sometimes you harm someone who is a friend of Allah. You don't realize what you're doing. So may Allah help us because if that continues, Allah may release the rope for a little bit. It's, it's like a dog leash. It is released for a bit. Once that rope is finished and there's no more rope left, he pulls it to the degree that the punishment comes and there is nothing that will actually help at that moment. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have mercy on all of us. If I were to make a mistake, a genuine heart would actually reach out to me to assist me, to help me, to try and let me see that particular light. That is a Muslim. That is what the Sahaba radiallahu anhum were taught by the doing of the Prophet His own actions. Take a look at Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. What did the Prophet say about him and about Abu Jahl? Abu Jahl was a man who harmed the Prophet ﷺ. He did so much. He was the main perpetrator of the crimes that were committed against the Muslims at the time. The Prophet ﷺ, in the night, he said to Allah, Allahumma a'izz al-Islam bi ahad al umarain Oh Allah, grant the strength to Islam through the acceptance of Islam by one of these two men who are haters. They hate Islam. They are trying to cause destruction. They are harming. Look at the, the Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Messenger of Allah, peace be upon him. Look at him. He is actually concerned about them coming to Islam. What would we do? Someone slapped us, someone harmed us, someone is an enemy, someone rejected Islam and walked away, etc. etc. We should firstly pray for them. We should ask Allah's guidance for them and for us. We are not even prophets of Allah and nowhere near. We need guidance ourselves. We have our own weaknesses that Allah has covered from the eyes of the people. So we look good. But if Allah were to expose us, perhaps we would look worse than those whom we think are bad. So this is why make a dua, learn from the Prophet 
you know, someone who commits a huge crime, a true believer will, yes, a true believer wants justice. That is part of your belief as well. We need justice. We will see the justice. But let that justice come minus the hate. That's what it is. We will serve justice. This person may even get the penalty that they deserve, which is very, very harsh. But we are doing it for their benefit sometimes. Sometimes we are doing it for the broader benefit. In Islam, punishments are such that they act as a deterrent for those who may be considering such in the future. You have a man, he slaps this man, he slaps the other man, he slaps the other man. Because he's big in size, everybody just says, thank you very much, and they get the slap. Until he comes to someone who says, hang on, hang on. I will face you for the sake of Allah and for the sake of the rest of the society and the rest of the community. But we pray for the person. May Allah guide them. So we will take them to task because we want to see justice so that it's not repeated. The crime is not repeated. But at the same time, we want to protect the society and community together with helping the individual realize and understand, I cannot do this. Imagine if that same person were to go back to each one of those whom he has harmed and really and sincerely said without being asked that you know what I was wrong and I'm very sorry please forgive me isn't it a change in society and community subhanallah isn't it something massive you know an apology is only an apology truly when it comes without being requested the minute you say I demand an apology you are asking for hypocrisy why people would say I'm sorry did they mean it? No, you extracted it from me. This thing is not going to go forward until you apologize. I'm sorry. That's what they said. What does that mean? Nothing. It just means because you said it's not going to progress, they apologize. A true apology is that which comes without being requested. I'm sorry. I really believe I was wrong, etc. etc. That is a true apology. The Prophet ﷺ made a dua, and no sooner did he make that dua for the two Umars. One was Amr ibn Hisham, who was known as Abu Jahl, and the other one was Umar ibn al-Khattab, radiallahu anhu, later to be known as. And the heart of one was softened by Allah. As for the other one, another dua of the Prophet ﷺ came into play. You see, the Prophet ﷺ, when he went to war with those who went to war with him, he didn't enjoy it. It wasn't some pastime that he loved. No, he prayed for their guidance even at that time. And he called his army and he told them to be just. He told Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu, you know, if even one of them is to be guided to the deen through you and your effort, it's better for you than anything very valuable, the most valuable thing that this world has. So he says, Allahumma kfina hum bima shikta. Oh Allah. He, he used to make on one hand a dua for guidance for them. And on the other hand, he, he said, oh Allah, if you haven't written guidance for them, then protect us from their harm in whatever way you feel fit. Whatever you know is best. If you want them to die, they may die. If you want them to live and you've paralyzed them, they may paralyze. If you want to occupy them with something else so that they cannot harm us, then do that. Whatever you know is best for them and for us, you do it, oh Allah. But protect us from their harm. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has granted that to the Prophet ﷺ. Another dua of the Prophet ﷺ was also that, Oh Allah, أَشْغِلْهُ بِنَفْسِهِ Oh Allah, this person, make him occupied with his own problem so that he stops troubling me. Allahu Akbar, look at the dua. So the person has one problem after another, after a third and a fourth, and they are so occupied, they can't even look to the right side to say, wait, I'm coming for you. We can't come for you because you know what? You are already so occupied. That was a dua that was made. We don't want to harm you, but because we don't want you to harm us, we are asking Allah, guide him. If you haven't written guidance for him, occupy him with himself. Subhanallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us an understanding. This was the love of the Prophet sallallahu He still cared. You know, if you look at more of the companions and those who have actually prior to their acceptance of Islam caused a lot of damage against the Muslims, a lot of damage, even death. One of the ones who has caused the greatest damage was a man known as Khalid ibn al-Walid ibn al-Mughira, later to be known as radiallahu anhumah. He was a powerful man. He has killed so many Muslims, so many, so many.
And the Prophet ﷺ taught us, yes, justice is one thing. Justice is one thing. But pray for the man that Allah gives him guidance. Let him come. Imagine he's so powerful. He's done so much. He has so much strategy. If that power could be used on the other side, what would happen? We would gain strength. The same applies to Umar ibn al-Khattab. He was such a solid man. The Prophet ﷺ says, grant strength to Islam through the acceptance of one of the two of them of Islam. Why would he say that? Because they are so powerful. If that power was channeled in the right direction, it would achieve results that were actually positive. Now that it's being channeled in the wrong direction, it is achieving negative results. Do we care? Do we have this mentality? Do we have this attitude? With us, we see one guy doing something wrong. Next thing, the Hajjud, we are up at 3, 4 p.m. Oh Allah, destroy him, break him, break his bones, kill him, make sure that he's gone in the next few days, and so on. This is what people say. Unfortunately, it's a weakness. The reason I raise this today is because we look at the lives of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, and we don't realize what they may have done prior to Islam. Yet it was the calmness of Islam that brought them to the deen. You know, the brother of Khalid ibn al-Walid, one of my favorite stories. His name was Al-Walid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu. He accepted Islam before Khalid ibn al-Walid. And in Medina, the Prophet ﷺ used to call him and ask him, tell me about your brother. What's happening with him? So they used to get responses, whatever. Some is narrated to us, some is not narrated to us. So he used to give the news. And the Prophet ﷺ used to say, he's a very intelligent man. Imagine this is talking about who? A man who caused the disaster on the day of Uhud. On the day of Uhud, there was a man who caused the disaster. Who was he? Khalid ibn al-Walid ibn al-Mughira. They feared him. But the Prophet ﷺ had hope. What was the hope? He says, Ya'ti bihi Allah. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Allah will bring him. Allah will bring him. He is a man. Did he say, oh Allah, destroy him, oh Allah, this. The Prophet ﷺ knows the power and intellect of this man. And all he's saying, oh Allah, let him jump camps. Let him come to the right side. At least he can do something good. Today, he, he became our champion, didn't he? He was also their champion at one stage. You see, now people in their emotions tend to forget that Islamic history. And they tend to forget the, the real sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ to make dua. When we say make dua for the perpetrator of the crime that was committed in Christchurch, for example, we are not saying that he should not face justice. No, those are two separate matters. To face justice is one thing. It's the right of awliya uddam. It's the right of the heirs of those who were killed to decide whether each one of them wants to forgive him or not. That's a separate matter altogether. All we are saying is imagine if he has to say the shahada while sitting in prison. Between him and Allah, hasn't he sorted at least one part of his life out? Hasn't he sorted a major thing out? That will come when we make dua for him, when we pray for him. This is one example. I can give you so many other examples. So then the Prophet ﷺ says about Khalid ibn Walid ibn Mughira radiallahu anhuma, he says, Ma mithlu Khalidin yajhalu Islam. A man as intelligent and as bright as Khalid can never be ignorant of the fact that Islam is the correct religion. It's impossible. If he, with his brain, he knows this is the right religion. Few days later, Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu anhu comes to Medina Munawwara. I'm cutting a long story short. He sees the Prophet sallallahu and he has a problem. What is the problem? I've killed so many people. What's going to happen to me? The Prophet sallallahu says, Ya Khalid, inna al-Islam ma yajubbu ma qabla. Oh Khalid, you know when you declare the shahada, it wipes out whatever bad you've done before. The man was stunned. I can only imagine what a criminal who's killed the best to tread the earth after the prophets of Allah, the companions of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. A person, you know, subhanallah, which it's not even imaginable as to their status. He killed them. He murdered them in cold blood. He planned and plotted with them against them. And you know what? Today he's coming and he's saying to the Prophet ﷺ, is that really the condition? Upon that condition? This is what you're telling me? That I'll really be forgiven if I declare the shahada? And he came on his own. He could have continued with that army, but he came. 
Because if he didn't come and he came on the day of the victory of Makkah, perhaps it would have been different. But when they went on the victory of Makkah, he was part of that victory. Allah wanted him to be part of the victory. Something he fought against, he was now part of the victory of that particular force. Subhanallah. So then when he said that, yes, you are totally forgiven, all the bad you've done wiped out, he declared his shahada. Who? A man who nobody would have believed that he would have accepted Islam. I give you another example. The prayer of the Prophet ﷺ on the day of Ta'if. I've already told you one or two of them. The Prophet ﷺ, when he made dua for guidance, he was offered to destroy them. He was offered. You want, we can just bring these two mountains together, crushed. He says, I am sent as a mercy. Subhanallah. You are sent as what? I am sent as a mercy. My brothers, my sisters, let's listen very carefully. Do we feel that we were part or we are part of the followers of the one who was sent as a mercy? No matter what you have in your heart, the hate factor, you need to take it out. You may hate a deed. Definitely we will hate deeds. There are deeds that we hate with a passion. Sins, murder, etc. We hate with a passion. But the person and the individual, we always have hope for them. We always have to have hope. Just like if it's your child on drugs, may Allah safeguard us from this, from this problem and the issue. If your child is on drugs, one year, two years, you are crying, three years, four years, five years, ten years, fifteen years, one day you still have hope that inshallah my son will come back. Am I right? You have hope. And if 20 years later the child comes back, you as a father or as a mother are so happy, so delighted, you embrace them as though nothing ever happened. Do you not think the mercy of Allah is higher than that? You have to keep having hope. We are living in a free world. We are living in a world that is so difficult. The environment is very challenging to say the least, where there are so many wrong things happening around us. To stay on the straight path is like walking through a thorn bush and even worse. In fact, it is similar to holding on to a red hot coal that's holding on to your deen. When people falter and go left and right, let's understand. Number one, pray for them. Yes, if you have it within your means to stop them, you shall stop them. That is also an act of worship. But do so with respect, with dignity. This is the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. This is what the teaching of the Prophet ﷺ has brought to us. The one who was sent. Allah says, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالَمِينَ Allah is addressing His beloved Messenger Muhammad peace be upon him saying and we have not sent you O Muhammad peace be upon him except as a mercy for the worlds for all for all completely as a mercy so let's have a little bit of mercy the hadith says La illahu illahu nas. Allah does not have mercy on the one who doesn't have mercy on the people he didn't say the Muslims he said the people in fact in another narration the Prophet ﷺ has told us about the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he says irhamu man fil ardi yarhamkum man fis sama the beginning of that hadith ar rahimuna yarhamuhum ar rahman irhamu man fil ardi yarhamkum man fis sama ar rahimuna those who have mercy on one another the most merciful will always have mercy on them and then he goes on to say have mercy upon those on earth and the one in the skies or in the heavens will have mercy on you. Amazing, amazing. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us to make dua for one another, to make dua for those we dislike, to make dua for those who have harmed us, to make dua for our enemies. And like I said, that does not mean we are compromising justice. Don't get me wrong. Allah says in the Quran, beautiful verse, which we hear almost every Friday. إِنَّ اللَّهَ يَأْمُرُ بِالْعَدْلِ وَالْإِحْسَانِ وَإِيْتَاءِ ذِي الْقُرْبَى Allah instructs you three things and the order is very important. Number one, justice. Number two, goodness. Number three, 
to make sure that your relatives are taken care of. Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar. Make sure your relatives are taken care of. Ita idil qurba, to give to your, your relatives. How can you be such a wealthy person with so much of ease? Your brother, your cousin, your auntie, your uncle, whoever is suffering and struggling. They don't even have medication. No, 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 no. You haven't understood the plan of Allah. Allah made you related to one another to test you. That's why he gave you a mother or a father. Otherwise, we would have just been growing from the ground like trees or what have you. Even trees are related through their seeds. Subhanallah. Imagine if you weren't related. Who was going to be connected to you? Who was going to look after you? Allah created love automatically through blood, automatically through marriage, automatically through the fact that you're human species. Today we are struggling across the globe. If, if it were not for those who have ease to reach out to those who were in a difficult situation, what would have happened? We would be witnessing people die and there will come a day when others will witness us die. Finished. So listen to the order. Allah says he orders you, in, he instructs you to be just. <coughs> then he says he instructs you thereafter to be kind. Kindness comes after justice. What does that mean? That is one of the most powerful verses in the whole Quran. Allah is telling you, you cannot keep on telling someone, be good, forgive them. Be good, leave them. Be good, leave them. Allah asks you to be good, leave it. Brother, he'll steal me, he'll take me, he'll rape, he will do, he will slap, he will murder. Must I keep on forgiving? That's not goodness. Goodness is when you stand up and face them because justice comes before goodness. Remember this. Part of goodness is to be just. Why? Imagine if we all, and this happens a lot, in community when something goes wrong, everyone goes to the good person and says, never mind, you're a good man, forgive me. Every time this happens, in community, with all of us, when you have a problem with someone and you know they are wrong, completely wrong, Community will come to the better of the two and tell them, never mind, have a big heart, forgive them. Hang on, hang on, hang on. What if they stole 100,000 of mine? Have a big heart. Subhanallah, I have such a big heart that I will name them so that they don't steal 100,000 from another man. That's called justice. You understand? We need to stand up firm for those who are wrong. It's part of the duty we have. That's another topic on its own, inshallah, perhaps on another occasion. So this is it. Allah says justice comes first, goodness comes second, and make sure that you look after and you take care of your relatives to begin with. Thereafter, entire humanity, and after you've taken care of humanity, even the other creatures of Allah, make sure that you take care of them, such as the animals, whether, whether they are tahir or not, even if it is a dog, you, may, you, you will be rewarded for reaching out to that particular dog at a time of need. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us all goodness. May He soften the hearts of the enemies. May He bring them to remorse, to, to regret their bad deeds. May He make us not from among those who have bad deeds. May He soften us if we are doing wrong against someone. Trust me, the heart that will go into Jannah first is the one that is the cleanest. Allah says, On the day of judgment, your children won't be able to help you. Your wealth will never be able to help you except the one who comes to Allah with a clean heart. Number one, that cleanliness firstly is referring to not associating partners with Allah. Your worship is straight with Allah and thereafter every other form of cleanliness and purity of the heart is included in it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant that grant us that clean heart and grant us Jannah al-Firdaus.